Hello everyone, my name is Yuri and today I will be your guide in a visit to Palazzo Abrogio di Negro. This visit is focused on an analysis of the architectural spaces, the structure and the frescoed images highlighting how this palazzo deviates from the rules of the time and how this reflects the character of its owner and commissioner, Ambrogio di Negro. Ambrogio di Negro was born into one of Genoa's ancient noble families and became one of the wealthiest men in the city thanks to some very risky trade agreements which he made especially as a young man. These allowed him to very rapidly and enormously increase his fortune. However, after some de deals went wrong, he preferred to move more cautiously, being content to increase his already huge fortune in a less conspicuous but also more reliable manner. Following his marriage to Minetta Spinola and the pressure from his newly acquired family, he bought the lot for the foundations of this palazzo, which was built between 1568 and 1572. He did not, however, choose the new prestigious street Strada Nuova, now via Garibaldi, but rather the area of Piazza Banchi, close to the financial and commercial heart of the city. The structure of the building itself is distinguished from those built in via Garibaldi. It has, in contrast, a large opening that from the atrium runs along the entire height of the palace, with a layout reminiscent, albeit on a smaller scale, of the villas outside the city walls. This is due to a stylistic choice by Ambrogio di Negro, who once again departed from the thought and way of acting typical of the Genoese aristocracy of the day. From here, the visit will continue in the three main halls to admire the frescoes by Semino's workshop that adorn the ceilings. Here we are in the Palazzo's main hall, which houses the cycle of Paris fresco. There are Latin maxims on the architraves that reflect De Negro's modus operandi. Just outside the hall, there is the inscription, Tendit in, er in ardua virtus, virtue aims at high peaks, and also virtutus in video commis, reminding us that virtue and power are always accompanied by envy, something that the nobleman himself experienced during his two years as doge. And the maxim that best represents his character is undoubtedly festina lente, hurry slowly. In only two words, the eternal search for balance between seizing an opportunity and recklessness is summarized. In the four corner pavilions are frescoes of the four ages of man, i.e. childhood, adolescence, adulthood and old age. The cycle of Paris begins with the episode of Hecabe, Paris's mother, abandoning him as his birth is overshadowed by a prophecy that indicates him as the author of the ruin of Troy. However, as always in Greek myth, any action taken to prevent a prophecy, prophecy proves key to a chain of events that eventually leads to its realization. Paris grows up in isolation, is joined by three beautiful goddesses who appoint him as judge to decide which of the three is the most beautiful, offering him wonderful rewards in exchange for victory. Paris awards victory with a golden apple to Venus, who rewards him with the love of the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen of Sparta. After returning to Troy and being recognized as his son by King Priam, Paris travels to Sparta where he meets Helen and falls in love with her. In the central panel, Helen's kidnapping is depicted and consequently the outbreak of the Trojan War that would lead, as prophesized, to its destruction. The theme of prophecy also recurs in the next living room. 
Here, the myth of Danae is depicted. A prophecy tells Danae, future mother of Perseus, that her son would cause the death of her father, the king Acrisius. To prevent this, the king locks his daughter Danae in a tower. But all this is fruitless, because, as we see in the central box, Danae is seduced by Zeus, who reaches her in the form of golden rain. From this union, Perseus is born. Discovered by King Acrisius, who hears the cries of the child, the king first quarrels with his brother, who he believes to be the father of the child, and then tries once again to deny fate, locking up Danae and the infant Perseus in a box and abandoning it to the waves. Fate, however, intervenes and saves them once more. They are found and welcomed by some shepherds. The theme of fate, of predestination as an undeniable and ineluctable fact, is dear to Ambrogio di Negro, according to whom predestination to positions of command in society is an undeniable right of the nobility of blood. In the last room, which illustrates Perseus's exploits in adulthood and the theme of personal abilities emerges, which are equally necessary to find one's own strength to reach leading positions. In this last room, Perseus's adventures are depicted. He is now an adult, and thanks to the help of the gods Athena and Hermes, who gift him with winged sandals, he is able to leave and find his own way. We then see him portrayed in his most famous adventure, the beheading of Medusa, and bringing her head as a weapon which petrifies his grandfather, Acrisius. Here he is depicted flying with Hermes' sandals, while Pegasus, usually referred to as his steed, appears only in the last panel, because, according to the myth, Medusa's blood gave him life, but he flew away immediately afterwards. Then, Perseus's last feat of bringing down the sea monster to save Andromeda, his future bride, and the founding of a new kingdom of which he becomes king. Thus, he does not become the successor of the treacherous grandfather Acrisius, but rather sovereign of a kingdom built of his own achievements. At the center of the vault, Athena and the Muses are depicted on Elecona Mount, from which flows the prodigious Hippocrene Spring, created by Pegasus, which infuses artistic inspiration. This theme is also dear to Ambrogio di Negro, who in addition to being a man of culture like all the aristocrats in general, was himself a man of letter and a writer. To complete the philosophic and allegorical interpretation, Perseus's rise to fame and glory is not simply because he is the son of Jupiter, but because of his ex exploits and his abilities. He does not take the place of his dethroned grandfather, but obtains his own kingdom. Noble blood is not enough. You need to rely on your strengths and abilities to achieve greatness. We may think to draw another parallel, that of Ambrogio's son, Orazio di Negro, born illegitimate and recognized only long after his birth. Ambrogio wanted to appoint him his universal heir, with even a testamentary clause that would have prevented other children born later to claim even part of the inheritance. With this analysis of Palazzo Ambrogio di Negro, its pictorial cycles and the history of its owner, we conclude our visit. Thank you for your attention. E nel modo di essere del suo creatore abbiamo concluso questa visita al palazzo e vi ringrazio per l'attenzione.